the problem in this country, women, by Nadia Ilahi, published on March fifteenth, twenty twenty-three. Note to the reader: Feel free to comment, talk to me on the page itself, or if you are reading it from my Facebook or Instagram, comments are especially welcome there as well. Recently, I found myself in a situation where, if I could do it all over again, I would certainly press the rewind button and choose a different path. After a particular Saturday night during my much-earned teaching sabbatical, I found myself missing papers I'd usually be grading over the weekend before rewatching Everything Everywhere All at Once, as the Oscars were the next day. An evening of essay grading and movie watching seemed sublime, but nope. Instead. I was out celebrating a friend's birthday, and this friend, by the way, literally imagine me use air quotes as I say "friend," found himself in a drunken stupor before shouting homophobic epithets and slurs at a group of guys outside the bar we were leaving, before also threatening to go grab his pistol to shoot them. What the fuck? Those of you who know me, this was beyond unacceptable. I don't even know how it all started. I just remember, as we were all leaving the pub, I turned around to see this friend swing a punch at one of the other men before the bar's security guard rushed out to break up the potential brawl that was about to ensue. Oh, and it get worse. Well, equally bad. He later shouted how the world is so messed up because of women. That the problem with this country is because of women. It is Women's History Month, and maybe he's jealous. He only gets one day in March for his birthday. I don't know, but again, what the fuck? He shouts this in front of three women, one being his own fiance and me. He never uses our names or blames us individually, but he might as well had since we are all women standing right in front of him, and apparently we're the problem in this country. The whole evening was a complete shit show, even before the misogynistic drunkenness of this person. And don't worry, dear readers, I have since removed myself from having anything to do with this group. And some were genuinely just as mortified as I was. But from what I could observe, enabling the behavior by excusing it all from the birthday beer and liquor he consumed. And as much as I'd like to remain a supportive friend to some of them. My well-being and safety come first. My succession premiere watch party invite list just got cut in half. So yes, it's safe to say he is no friend of mine. The overall night also triggering past trauma I have had to deal with from misogynistic and verbally abusive men in my life. Not to mention knowing the feeling of having derogatory slurs thrown at me, not because of my sexuality, but because of my skin color. And the LGBTQ plus community have a special place in my heart, which is not news unless you've never met me. This Pakistani Southern belle wasn't having it. I have to admit that I'm still reeling from it, feeling a bit embarrassed that I would even associate with this person, especially knowing he's a self-proclaimed conservative. But in my defense, as a bleeding heart liberal, I was trying to keep an open mind and bridge the divide, regardless. The whole experience felt both surreal and very real because I know this is how a lot of men think and feel, even without the excuse of booze. If anything, the booze only heightened his truth. Days after this shit show night, where am I now? Ugh. Well, it's still March and it's still Women's History Month, so I will celebrate that. In a post I published back in the summer of 2021, I shared how men find me intimidating. But as I don't want to rehash the whole post, you can catch up here at this link. But in it, the gist of it entailed how in high school the guys found me intimidating and refrained from asking me out. At least this was relayed to me by some of the guys at my high school's 10th year reunion. Fast forward to my singleness at 46. And the intimidation is still there for some men I meet, including the gentleman caller from a previous post I shared, who ghosted me after I invited him to dinner. 
His ghosting explained as, I forgot, as he traveled off to Vegas with a friend. Dude, go to Vegas. I don't care. Just don't humiliate me in the process or insult my intelligence. I just casually chalk it up to, I'm just not their type. But it does make me wonder if there is something more to it. Nadia's intimidating. Where does this intimidation come from? What makes me intimidating to men? What about me scares off people? And where or whom does it come from? Is it genetic? Is my intimidation the reason the world is so messed up and that we women are the problem in this country, as my former conservative friend declared? Regardless, and most importantly, all of this has me thinking about the influential women in my family who may have had some part of shaping the woman I am today, shaping me into the intimidating woman I appear to be at 46. Without a doubt, both my mother and sister have had a huge influence in my life and for the good. My sister Mercy, being the oldest, paved the road for me in a lot of ways, like showing me the ropes when I got to high school and college. She was my first friend and my first role model. She was also my first roommate as we shared a bedroom for the first 16 years of my life. A lot of firsts with her. Then there's my mom, Venus, aptly named the goddess of love. And if you know me, then you know how much I adore my mother. Her courage to elope with my dad and move across the world with him to start a new life, defying her parents' wishes in the process, and her unconditional love are the reasons I am here today. The reason why I can live in America and dream the impossible. I devoted a whole post to my mother and father's love story a few years back. A post my mother is both proud of and still shy about. Her modest demeanor clearly something I did not inherit. And with that, you can read that post here at this link. But as it is March and Women's History Month, I wanted to devote this post to a particular woman in my life who, unfortunately, is no longer with my family. This piece has been in the works for a couple of months, in fact, but recent events as shared in the opening have channeled my approach to it differently, thus the title. A few posts back, I briefly shared that I lost a dear family member to cancer this past December. Her loss has been hard for so many. Whether she was a daughter, a sister, a niece, a mother, a wife, an aunt, or for me, a dear cousin, this amazing woman, Ruth Munni, was beloved and will be greatly missed. The news of her passing hit me hard in so many different waves when I first learned of her death. Nonetheless, my mind and heart were flooded with all the memories I was fortunate to share with her. For me, growing up, Muni was like this awesome rock star, this larger-than-life being, despite her petite stature, something the boys in the family always teased her about. But if you knew Muni, then you know she gave it right back to the boys. They didn't stand a chance against her, and for that, this intimidating woman was greatly respected. I certainly admired her. And because of her outer beauty, I always likened her appearance to the Princess Jasmine from Aladdin, wishing I could be as beautiful as she was. It's no coincidence that Princess Jasmine remains my favorite Disney princess to this day. Being first cousins, Winnie was like a big sister for my sister and me. In fact, in the Pakistani culture, cousins are just as equal as siblings, even being referred to as a sister or brother instead of just cousin. And like Mercy paved the road for me in high school and college, our big sister Muni paved the way for Mercy. Mercy has shared with me the time Muni came to her rescue at college. It was the first week of Mercy's college classes, and she was dining on campus for lunch at the cafeteria alone, feeling stressed and nervous as any first day of school can bring. Thinking she would have to brave the experience solo, Muni showed up to keep her company providing a much-needed comfort for the new freshman. Being my big sister and always having to look out for her younger siblings, Mercy was able to find a big sister in Winnie who was there to look out for her. My sister's antidote about this lunch experience with Winnie had me thinking something. Winnie was of middle school age when she first came to the U.S. from Pakistan. 
I was very young when she and her family immigrated to Louisiana, so I can only imagine what those first days of school were like for her, knowing there was no big sister to keep her company on top of having to start school in a brand new country. I'm sure that could not have been easy, but knowing the kind of woman Winnie grew into, I can confidently say she handled it with strength and courage that I know she inherited from her mother, my aunt, one of four of my dad's older sisters. All four Elahi sisters had, and have as only one is alive today, living in Australia, embarking on her 90th year, the kind of guts and determination that made them tenaciously strong and, dare I say, intimidating. Whatever it was, Winnie had it, and she always had the younger cousins back when we'd have family gatherings. I do miss those fun and mischievous hide-and-seek games we cousins played. We'd partner up, and I always wanted to be paired with Winnie, knowing she'd protect me when we hid deep inside the bedroom closets. She was tiny in size, but fierce. As I got older and was in college, she was living the independent adult life as an established pharmacist who used to pick my sister and me up in her fancy red convertible Honda Prelude and take us on drives through town. Those were the best. She'd drive us all over Monroe, especially through our city's university campus, the college we all attended. And on these drives, we'd gossip about the boys we had crushes on, share things we couldn't share with anyone else in the family, especially the brothers. And then after these adventurous drives in the prelude, she'd stop and buy us frozen yogurt at I Can't Believe It's Yogurt. I returned the favor during her bachelorette soiree by convincing the bartender to give us ladies a little peep show. It was more fun than going out for yogurt. By the way, the featured photo of this post is me far right with Mercy on the far left as Winnie sits in the middle holding her baby niece, Sarah, who is now in her 20s pursuing a career in pharmacy as her aunt did. The picture was taken around 1998. And this one time I'll never forget, Winnie took Mercy and me to see the animated film Beauty and the Beast. She had already seen it, loved it so much that she wanted to take my sister and me to see it as well. I remember feeling so honored she wanted to do that. I can't really explain it, but it made me feel cool that my grown-up, beautiful cousin would want to go to the movies with an awkward high school kid who never felt seen. Money had a way of doing that. She had to be tough at times, being the only daughter with two brothers. But I think that's what made her the sweet, empathetic, and strong-willed woman she was maybe even a little intimidating. And the only problem I see here with women in this country is that Winnie is no longer with us. It is a problem that the rest of the country is missing out on this great woman. It is a problem that her two beautiful sons will miss out on so much more from her. So, when I think about the drunken exclamatory statement from the conservative friend, here's my second take. Exterior, outside, neighborhood pub, Toluca Lake, California, night, 3 a.m. Drunk dude, slurred speech. The problem with this country today is women. Things are so messed up because of women. Because of, because of you, Nadia. Pakistani Southern Belle sighs, rolls her eyes. Sure, dude, I'll concede. Pauses. This country is so unabashedly, so beautifully, and so wonderfully messed up and problematic because of us women, and we aren't going anywhere, so get used to it. Pause. Pakistani Southern Bell, near whisper. Oh, and fuck off. Walks herself home. <laughs>